Good afternoon, everyone. We'll be getting started here in just a few minutes. I want to get some of our attendees in-house before we start making our housekeeping announcements. So we'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. Okay, it looks like the majority of our people are coming in. I'd like to say good morning to those of you on the West Coast and good afternoon to those in the East. My name is Billy Zadig, Standards and Codes Administrator for APA. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is being recorded. The recording and presentation slides will be posted on our webpage on the APA website in a few days. Continuing education credits as well as AIA CLUs are being given for this webinar. Please contact me at Billy, B I L L I E, at APA.org for more information. Also, if you have more than one person attending this session from a central location, please contact me so I can make sure everyone gets credits for attending. We can go on to the next slide. This webinar is being jointly presented by APA and SHEMA. APA Standards and Code Council began presenting these webinars in the fall of 2017. If you are interested in participating in either APA or SHEMA, please contact us. Next slide. This slide gives you the names of our standards of the APA Standards and Codes Council, who it was their uh, idea to bring these webinars to our members and other people, other affiliates. Today's webinar presenters are John Delahunt from University of Texas at San Antonio and Scott Thomaston from Emory University. John has managed EHS and risk in higher education since 1989. While at Colorado College, he launched a comprehensive EHS program. Today, at the University of Texas at San Antonio, he serves as a university's fire marshal and risk manager. Scott Thomaston has served as the director of environmental programs for the EHS office at Emory University since 1989. Prior to Emory, Scott was an environmental scientist at Georgia Tech Research Institute in Atlanta, Georgia. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn this over to John and Scott. Howdy, y'all. Um, this is John DeLahunt, currently from the University of Texas at San Antonio, and uh, I'll be running over the first part of this. Um, we just wanted to give you a sense of what we're getting into. Uh, we wanted to talk about the context and the timeline, how we invented this, uh, how we came to create this guide. Uh, we wanted to talk about the who we intended to speak to and what we were trying to get done with the guide, how we structured it, um, and then explain a little bit about the current context and what's happening right now, and then also uh, give a chance to see some of the ideas that we have for where we can go with this guide. So, in the late 90s, uh, 20 years ago, um, 
there was a movement by the Environmental Protection Agency to examine what higher education was doing with respect to its environmental compliance obligations. Um, this was not unprecedented. There had been EPA actions uh, against higher education institutions for uh, long before the, the late 90s, but the, there was a real groundswell of activity in the late 90s, um, and especially focused in uh, the Northeast in New England, um, and it makes perfect sense. The, in Boston and Massachusetts, generally, higher education is big business, and uh, so that's why the, uh, there was a big focus over in Region 1, which is the New England area. Um, but I've highlighted for you at least one uh, major case. So the University of Hawaii uh, received a $1.8 million fine in 1998, 1999 after some inspections found um, decades worth of hazardous materials in the basements, in storerooms, waiting for disposal but not disposed of yet. Um, and that was contrary, of course, to the expectations. Um, so in the late 90s, uh, many of us in higher education, and especially the uh, Government Relations Committee with the Campus Safety Health Environmental Management Association, SHEMA, we were looking around and thinking that we needed to do something. Uh, and so we thought that we ought to uh, find a way to deal with the complexity of the regulatory compliance requirements. And you can see here a, a graph. Scott and I have been talking about what this graph might look like if we extended it past 2000, the year 2000. Um, but you can see this sort of hockey stick graph of uh, new environmental laws and new expectations coming uh, from the government. And the expectation is that even if you're in education, you'll comply. Uh, but it requires an awful lot of work. And then, of course, the campuses, uh, all of our campuses are complex, and uh, Scott has uh, offered us a couple of uh, uh, things, we, things we run across. These are probably similar to what happens at your campus, but uh, in the upper left there, or the upper right there, that's a, a cylinder of chlorine gas found in the basement of an old home. Um, and then, uh, I, Scott, it was, who was it? King Tut? That it's Ramses. He, he, he oh, came Ramses. to visit. Yes. King Ramses came to visit, but he came with an unknown white powder in the sarcophagus, and uh, that raises a lot of what is this eyebrows. Uh, and then over here on the right, we have a um, or something we're going to talk about a little later on. This is one of the new things that's happening in environment in college campuses is the presence of polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs in caulk material. And then how does that caulk material release the PCB into the surrounding masonry or cement? And then is that something that the EPA is concerned about? It turns out the answer is yes. So our timeline, uh, we released the first edition in July of 2002, following about an 18 month development cycle. Um, so we had all these uh, citations and, and inspections, notices of violation and a sort of million dollar, $100,000 fines being handed out to higher education, and we reacted pretty quickly. Um, in 2008, we released the second edition, um, and that was uh, a very much faster timeline because not much had changed. Uh, and then in July of this, of last year, actually, we released the third edition, uh, and that development timeline was uh, a lot longer than the 18 months, but for some good reasons. Um, and really, the, the the feeling has been that what we should be doing is, uh, as uh, Linus is saying here, it's better to light a, a candle than to curse the darkness. And uh, I'm sure that there are some around who would still believe in what Lucy says, but not us. We believe in the candle. So the target audience, uh, there are about 4,000 institutions of higher education. When we were trying to build this guide, Shima had the idea to build the guide, but we knew that we needed APA because APA had the reach. Um, in 2000, there were approximately 1,500 uh, APA members. Um, and so as we thought this through, we decided that our, in, in writing commonly, what we, what we say is that we need to write for one person. And so the one person that we were writing for was a senior facilities officer who didn't have environmental staff, but had environmental pressure and was in the United States. And it's important that we say in the United States because we're dealing with US federal law. We're not dealing with others. Um, and we're not dealing with state law. So we all know the impossible trinity in construction is uh, price, schedule, and quality, or you can have it fast, cheap, or well, pick two. Uh, it works the same way in, in writing. You can have it broad, detailed, or short, pick two. Um, and uh, so as we worked through the, the guide, 
we decided that we were going to go for short and we were going to go for broad. So we were going to cover a lot of bases and we were going to do it in a thin book. And that meant that we had to go against every environmental manager's instinct and write a very few number of a very small number of words. Um, so that this is very difficult for the environmental specialists to um, to cut down their words. What we set out for was a readable, action-oriented, uh, and defensive mindset book. So at the very beginning, we were talking about this uh, this in a defensive way. We wanted to make sure that people had the basics that they could use to counter an EPA inspection because at the time that was what we were facing. Uh, and so we took short sentences, short words. The idea is that we wanted to make it highly readable and active voice and directive um, means that you need to do this and we won't let anybody off the hook. The, the campus needs to do this or someone in the campus needs to do this. So that was the first edition. The second edition, we'd had uh, about five or six years with a Republican president, so not much had changed. Uh, the Campus Consortium on Environmental Excellence, C2E2, NACUBO, APA, and EPA got together and, and uh, built an e-compliance portal, and they decided to use uh, some of the, of the text of the second edition in that portal. Um, and we, we made very few changes. Um, so it, the, we did edit some sections for clarity and brevity, and we added a few things. Waters of the state, uh, the Rapinos decision had just come out, and uh, that, uh, that put waters of the state, which is a very important thing for the Clean Water Act, is a very important term, and it put all of that into turmoil, and it, the turmoil is, has actually not resolved in the last um, eight, years, eight or 10 years. Um, and then we, I, we accidentally dropped this section. That was, uh, we just miss, missed it in the, in the flurry. And we adjusted some appendices. So it was very minor. Um, third edition context, uh, as we started to do the work about three years ago, it had been seven years and mostly with a Democratic president. Uh, just as we published the, first, the second edition, subpart K, which is a way for academic laboratories to manage their waste that's different than the regular RICRA, uh, the regular hazardous waste uh, regulations. That had just come out. EPA had delivered an endangerment finding, the campaign against coal, and then the PCBs issue that we talked about before. So there were some things changing in the, in the field, and we thought it was time for us to reset and adjust. So that adjustment uh, we made it a, more about management environmental, of environmental programs and not about a defensive compliance posture. So we really did make it more of a, of a management. Now, EPA, you should know, is not, has not ceased focusing on higher education. They're just looking at us a different way because they've moved on to hospitals. Um, and they've learned that hospitals also have the same problems. And so they're, they're working with them. So we wanted to put it in a, in, a, in, a, in a position of being a management program because after 20 years, this really is something that you should have your hands around and you ought to just know how to work the problem. And you might be struggling with priorities. You might be struggling with what's important and what are some neat tricks and good ways to solve the problem. So we're trying to make that the tone of this book. Um, because of that, we retitled it from the Environmental Compliance Assistance Guide to the Environmental Management Guide. Uh, we expanded the focus. Uh, that has an impact on asbestos, especially in the U.S., um, but it made it the, instead of being the Environmental Compliance Assistance Guide for Colleges and Universities, it's now the Environmental Management Guide for Education Facilities, and that's reflecting APA's move towards K-12 through and also SHEMA's move to, towards K-12 through as districts become more and more savvy with this. They're beginning to hire safety staff, and we're interested in helping them out. We added a new section to each of our regulatory legislative summaries, and uh, that section is called, What Should I Do? So instead of, What Do I Have to Do? Or in addition to, What Do I Have to Do? The guide now includes advice in every section, and there's 36 or 37 regulatory legislative sections. Uh, in each of those sections, it gives you good advice from the team, the writing team, and the writing team, uh, last I checked, has more than 300 years experience managing environmental health and safety issues on college campuses. And so the collective wisdom of that whole team is uh, distilled into this book in some way. We added summaries for new issues or emerging issues, those are greenhouse gases, waste pharmaceuticals, subpart K, and then PCB spills into building materials. Again, this is a, a new and awful thing that's coming around. We also brought the lost summary back, the waste from maintenance operations, uh, expanded the resources, added some new appendices, 
Um, and then I've got to stop here for a minute and congratulate the APA production staff. Um, they did an amazing job of producing this book. It took us a long time to get the content together, but once we got the content together, APA staff really turned it around and turned it into a beautiful book. Um, of the three editions, this is by far my favorite. Color on every page, a very readable typeface, and a very legible layout. So it's a, it's a wonderful book just from a production perspective. So the third edition follows the, the previous two editions. There's an introduction, a narrative, uh, a matrix. We'll talk about the matrix in some detail here. And the regulatory program summaries, and we'll talk about those just generally, but uh, you'll have a list of what those are. The narrative, the point of the narrative is to give you a short, uh, a short read, about 20 pages, on what an environmental, a comprehensive environmental management program should be and how do you get it started how do you keep it going and what does it include so we we talk about that foundation why are you doing it figure out why you're doing it in some cases you might be doing it because the epa has just left your campus and they've they've dropped off a letter called a notice of violation and it's not a letter it's a ream and if you have that experience then you probably need to be paying attention to environmental law um, but you may also be doing it simply because your campus wants to be ahead of the curve and not get caught up in that. And you may also be doing it because your campus is busy being uh, green and sustainable, but you also recognize that complying with, with federal law is a mandatory part of a sustainability program. Whatever, uh, you need to find whoever it is that's going to create that change for you and, uh, and, and make that your foundation. Um, so you have to understand what you're working with. You've got to prepare a plan, uh, find ways to create responsibility and partnerships, and then uh, develop the program. So the meat of that narrative uh, is what are these core elements? So in our experience, we think that these are very important things for everyone to have in their environmental management program. Even before you start assessing where you're going to take actual steps to mitigate your uh, compliance with federal law or mitigate your environmental impact, you need to be ready for spills and releases because those could happen at any time. So you can't put that off. Um, it's crucial that you understand what chemicals are on your campus and it's crucial that you make a plan to manage the waste you can't simply hope that it goes away um, and that plan needs to include a safe space uh, we talk about tracing drains and surface flows uh, this is an important issue uh, in terms of spills and releases if you don't know that your floor drains go to the creek or if you don't know that your storm drain storm drains go to the sewer then whatever disposal choices you make may affect adversely affect the environment. So those are things that you want to pay attention to. Um, and then you certainly want to be looking around and looking at what your spaces, how your spaces look and how you're taking care of business on in all of your spaces. Uh, in the third edition, we added a section called Compliance Assurance Documentation. And so this is uh, keeping the, the records that you need available so that if somebody should ask for them, they are available. Uh, and the, among those records are uh, determinations that you actually don't have this problem on your campus or in this building. And that may very well be true of a new building that uh, has been built after 1978, may very well not have asbestos in the building. And if that's true, that's an important record to keep because somebody may ask one day. Um, so those we think are the basic elements, but then there are value added elements. These will make your program better. And so we, the, the narrative includes detail on all of these being involved, uh, performing audits, which could be internal audits, peer audits, or external audits, uh, working with regulators, making a plan for inspections, um, making a plan for property acquisitions. We recognize that real estate is the strategic capital of higher education. If you don't have land around your campus, you can't grow, but you probably shouldn't uh, buy that old gas station without doing some due diligence and making sure that you're ready to clean up the gasoline spill that's under it. Uh, this is new uh, to the third edition, and we had our legal advisor, uh, Phil Hagen, who was with Georgetown Environmental Health and Safety, is now there in a faculty role, but is also a, a legal scholar, and his uh, part of his practice is due diligence with property acquisitions, so we really got an expert on that one. Um, and then watching the horizon, this is also something that you should be paying attention to. EPA does very, very few things that are surprising. 
Um, they have they telegraph their agenda, and if you don't watch the telegraph, you're not going to know what their agenda is. So you may be surprised, but it's not because they didn't tell you. It's because you might not have been watching. And then we also want you to consider going above and beyond compliance. And so find a way to make your environmental program, your environmental management program, integrate and work with your sustainability program. Your students and some of your staff are probably very interested in sustainability, uh, but they may not understand the nuts and bolts of what it takes to manage a campus and what a Clean Air Act permit requires or what hazardous waste determinations are. Uh, it's a good idea to, to incorporate those and leverage the desire and enthusiasm for sustainability into getting support for your program. So after that's the narrative in brief. Uh, after the narrative, we have a, a 10 page matrix in the third edition. So five tables, two pages each. Um, and that covers the, uh, it covers 40 different academic or 40 different campus programs. And we'll, we'll list those here in a second. Uh, and then it lists it or it has, um, on the, those are across the top and then down the side on the left hand side here you can see uh, regulatory and legislative program areas and so the, this is just a, a little snippet of the matrix but it shows you that we have given you three different levels of concern that you might have where your program your academic program intersects with a regulatory requirement and so uh, lab sciences on this chart you can see doesn't have much of an impact on stormwater and those of you who do construction can probably agree that what happens inside the lab probably doesn't very much affect the stormwater but all of us can think of reasons why we would want to consider that for instance if your laboratory is occurring outside um, in a construction site you might want to consider the stormwater impact of having your laboratory exercise occurring there so this allows you to assess your regulatory requirements by the program area, which means if you're going to focus on your auto shop, you can just go down the column that is the auto shop on the auto shop on the uh, maintenance and operations page and assess where you have priority issues uh, and assess where you have lower priority issues. Conversely, you can also go across the matrix and you can assess all of your areas by a certain regulatory requirement. So if you decide that you're going to get your stormwater program in gear, then you could look across all five tables and see which campus programs we think have a stormwater impact or have a stormwater impact that's, that's uh, worth prioritizing. And again, what this will let you do is instead of going to everybody and saying, do you have a stormwater impact, you could go to the construction people, which is really where the stormwater impact is, and ask them how they're dealing with stormwater. And most of us in the US are familiar with stormwater protection programs or SWPPs or SWIPs, but that's an example. Um, we made some assumptions in the matrix, and so anybody who uses, this is all described in, in text in the book, but we wanted to make sure that you knew it. Um, if there's a check mark, it's something that you definitely need to check on. And if there's a question mark, you might wanna look into it. Uh, if it's blank, that doesn't mean that there's no possibility you're going to get dinged on that. There's still a circumstance where I can imagine uh, a photo darkroom or a photo or an art studio course uh, or activity having an impact to a, a groundwater discharge. And that's if you're doing, for instance, cyanotyping in the forest. Uh, cyanotyping is a kind of photography that uses potassium ferrocyanide. Uh, and it's the kind of thing that you don't want to just release into the creek. Uh, but if you're out there doing that work, I can imagine that you would need to pay attention to it. So uh, we don't have anything marked for uh, art programs and discharge permits. But if you have an art program that's using chemicals out in the boondocks out, outside and they want to just dump it into the creek, that's a discharge and you need to pay attention to it. We also assume that the issue that we're talking about is under the control of the campus program that's noted. So in a health center, for instance, you can imagine that there would be universal waste in the light bulbs and there would be polychlorinated biphenyls in the old ballasts, the old, uh, the old uh, magnetic ballasts. So, or, or I'm sorry, the old electric ballasts. So um, in those cases, those are gonna show up under maintenance operations, not under the health center. So the health center is what does the health center control, not what do the facilities people control in the health center? I hope that makes sense. Um, and one of the reasons that we split these up the way we did check mark, question mark, no, no mark, is if we marked everything that is possible for you, we would just mark every box. There's no real point in doing that. So what we thought we would do is try to find a way to prioritize for the user 
where they should be emphasizing uh, so that they got a good first start. So these are the program areas that you'll see in the matrix, academic, student activities, operations, maintenance. Um, operations includes uh, K through 12, that's where all the K through 12 stuff shows up, and the business startups, the incubators, that's in it. Uh, operations, we needed a place, that was it. Uh, maintenance, and then utilities. So maintenance and utilities, for sure, are gonna be places that APA folks are gonna wanna look, even if you're on a large campus with EHS people, um, you may want to be paying attention to this anyway, but if you're on a smaller campus or you don't have EHS people, then uh, certainly all five pages of this are going to end up being something that facilities probably has to deal with. It's our experience that on a smaller campus, if you want someone to do it, but you don't know who, you usually call facilities and it usually goes to the assistant director. And so that assistant director ends up having to become an expert. And that's really who we wrote this book for. for so that they would be able to quickly understand what's going on and what do they have to do. So the summaries, and um, I'm gonna turn this over to Scott here in just a second. The summaries are uh, federal only. We wanted you to know that up front. There's no state guidance in here because then we would be writing 52 or 53 books. Um, they, all the summaries are short. We are not trying to tell you what to do. We're trying to tell you where the trailhead is so that you can find out how best to walk the trail yourself. The structure of the summary includes the background. Um, what, what does this law deal with? What does this regulatory program deal with? Uh, the key concepts, basically the definitions that are subject or, or relevant in that summary. Uh, does it apply to your campus? And the answer there is yes or maybe. If the answer was no, then we wouldn't have included it. There was no point. So it's yes or maybe. And so, uh, and we tell you how to tell the difference. Uh, and then we, we have two sections on what's next. So what do I have to do? These are the regulatory requirements. And then what should I do? This is the helpful advice that's new in the third edition. So this is where we went around the table and asked the 15 or 20 people who were participating, what has worked well on your campus campuses in the past, and then try to find a way to distill that into good advice. Scott? Yep. So good afternoon, this is Scott Thomaston. Greetings from Atlanta, Georgia. So it, as my good friend and Texan friend John says, the summaries are bringing you to the trailhead because the regulations are incredibly complex. Uh, no one person can distill it all. So the way that we tried to do this book, as we've talked about, is just distill it down into sections that you would be concerned about. And in this first slide regarding summaries, there's just, and I'll go over these uh, momentarily, but Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, CERCLA, uh, EPCRA, there's too many acronyms, uh, FIFRA, RECRA, Safe Drinking Water Act, so forth, you're likely subject to any of those. So uh, almost every section is going to be applicable. And as John also indicated, we have put helpful advice in each section or in each summary about the what, what you might need to know just to get you started. Would you go to the next slide, please, John? So Clean Air Act, if you burn fuel on your campus or if you cool air, you're gonna be likely subject to Clean Air Act. So if you have a boiler, if you have chillers, you're gonna be subject to this in some form or fashion. That's gonna be air emissions, what kind of permit you have, what are you doing with CFCs, how do you manage CFCs, et cetera. Uh, and without just reading all the, or going through a lot of detail about it, you can see all the section under Clean Air Act. It is a very, very complex, uh, complex regulation. Uh, on our campus, we're in a uh, we have a Title V permit in a non-attainment area. That means we burn a lot of fuel, and it's hot in Atlanta in the summer. Uh, it's complex to the point that we have a consultant do the work, but we had to know to bring in the consultant. We had to know where to point the consultant. So, Clean Water Act. If you store fuel or if storm water is on your campus, you're more than likely subject to Clean Water Act. Or if you have sewer systems. So, in this, there's um, you know. Just depending on your municipalities, at least in our case, you know how we manage it depends on municipality. So, but we're we're bringing this back up to a federal level. So, um, you have to have a spill control prevention and countermeasure plan if you have over 1,300 gallons of fuel, for example. Um, and then when you get into the the circular comprehensive environmental response compensation and liability act, affectionately known as Superfund, if you don't know you have a Superfund problem on your campus, you have a gigantic problem. A few campuses do, it does happen, but it's something that's managed very closely. So, John, if you go to the next slide. 
Yeah, Scott, I just wanted to mention one of the things that we, in, in some of these uh, program areas, there are, there are requirements for, for instance, spill control in many different areas, many different laws have expectations for spills. And so as a, a way to consolidate all of that, we, we put, for instance, everything having to do with spills into the circular section on, on releases. In the same way, we did, we did the same thing with lead-based paint and asbestos. We tried to limit those to one section and try to incorporate all of the requirements from all the different places into that one section. Back to you. So a subsection of, of CERCLA is Emergency Planning and Community Rights No Act. And that's, uh, there's a, there's a uh, report that we, you have to do once a year called Tier 2, and it's, it's simply just an inventory of hazardous materials on your campus. And what we found is that a, a large number of people did not recognize they had to do that. And the EPCA report goes to the fire service. So if there's an issue, the fire service has a, or your emergency responders have an idea of what you may have to do or what they're going to be faced with. Uh, Federal Insecticide and Rodenticide Act, if you spray for something, if you spray for weeds, insects, or if you have rodents, you have, and also febra can drift into the laboratory, so you'll be subject to that. Um, the, the big one that we all have to deal with is Resource Conservation Recovery Act. So the easier part of it are underground storage tanks. So if you have underground storage tanks, you're subject to RICRA. Underground storage tanks are not terribly difficult to manage. The one that gives us all gray hair and sleepless nights would be the hazardous waste portion of RICRA. And it's ever-changing. It's incredibly complex. Um, but everybody has to deal with that. So, And again, the book, we try to distill it down into what you have to start thinking about and point you to the regulations. I will point out the picture there as we talk about FIFRA. I know you can't read the, the, the text on that, but that's a truck spraying DDT on the beach, and the kids are running through the DDT, so times have changed. Um, anyway, I don't want to get into a great amount of detail with this because it'll, it'll, it'll stop it. So, John, if you'll go to the next slide. So, Safe Water Drinking Act. So, you're subject to Safe Water Drinking Act if you have well water and you're servicing over 10 taps. If you got 10 faucets and you have well water, you're subject to Safe, subject to safe Drinking Water Act. Um, a few schools are, are subject to that. I know that John and I had a discussion where he had a situation where he had to, he was subject to that in, a, in an offsite area. But again, the point is to point uh, is to make you think about it. Toxic Substance Control Act is a whole world upon itself, and the important part about this, it interweaves with so many of the other regulatory issues that we've discussed. So, for example, you know, asbestos is in this, and asbestos is covered by a lot of or many other regulations. Um, actually, it gets into biotechnology and nanotechnology, which is, um, it's, Tosca interweaves back with facilities and back with research areas as well. And we did add nanomaterials to this particular, to this edition, because that has, uh, is becoming a larger and larger, or we discussed it more in this edition because it's becoming a larger issue. We briefly talked about PCBs at the beginning of this. Um, many of us don't know what to do with PCBs and building materials or, or exactly how to handle it. It's, um, it's a universally hushed subject among those of us that do what I do just because it's a, it's a complex matter and we haven't come to a conclusion on it. And even though we, this is a federal level, some of the EPA regions regulate PCBs differently. So anyway, that's just, that is a very brief summary of the summaries in this. And I think the point is, is if you, if to look at the summaries and see if you actually think you have an issue or if you have to be in compliance and then start going into the regulations from that point. Do you have any additions, John? No, sir. I believe the next will be yours. Yes, indeed. So we, uh, for the third edition, we developed a core team. So I was the editor of the first and second editions. And so there was a certain amount of made sense for me to do it again. Uh, Scott Thomaston at the time was the the co-chair of the Shima Community of Practice relating to environment and sustainability. So this is the campfire around which all the environmental management folks um, gather in, in the world of Shima. Uh, Jack Dempsey has recently retired from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, um, where I think he was the uh, a senior associate vice pontiff for all campus operations, um, and uh, he was uh, the co-editor on the on the first edition, and so we brought him back into the team, and uh, he was uh, he's 
was a great help to us in terms of keeping us uh, on task and short. We, we, uh, we were cutting words in Jack's name for um, the entire duration. Uh, Kim Dalton Ferris had retired from SUNY uh, Geneseo, but she uh, asked to be involved in the third edition and we had space. So we, uh, she was a technical writer for us. Uh, but like us, SUNY Geneseo is a small college, and so she was doing everything environmental health and safety, and she was doing it at New York State, which is a difficult place to work in our field. And uh, so she has a, a, a great what the great breadth of knowledge and is a, a very skilled technical writer, so we were delighted to have her on the team. Uh, we added Victoria Justice from the Turning Bird Group. Victoria had been at the University of Maine and then went into private practice doing consulting, and part of what Victoria does and the Turning Bird Group does uh, has been to uh, establish peer audit programs in uh, the mid-Atlantic states, Pennsylvania, places like that. Uh, and I think she's done some work further south. The, um, uh, but that has put her on about 400 college campuses looking at environmental health and safety issues. And that makes her more or less peerless in terms of um, understanding what the, what the situations really are out there on the campuses. Also on our core writing team was Chris Cox, who works in the uh, facilities group at CU Boulder. He's an environmental health and safety officer hired and, uh, and working within the facilities organization. So as we were finishing up on our, on our uh, content development, uh, we were cross-checking what we knew or what we were writing to, with Chris to make sure that it made sense in the context of facilities. Now, at Colorado College, I worked in a facilities environment for 18 years, and so I know some of the language and some of the the concerns, but it was important to us to have another APA, and this Chris was actually representing the APA side of the table on in our core writing team, and so he was a, a tremendous asset to our team. The uh, contributors, um, so we will know these names. Many of these are uh, these are all environmental management people, but um, uh, these are. Uh, this is where the 300 years of experience comes from. So uh, Larry Gibbs has recently retired from Stanford and uh, Peter Ashbrook recently retired from Mizzou. Uh, these are folks who have been in the business for, for decades and uh, they are peerless in our, uh, in, our, in our business. So we think that we really have gotten the cream of the crop to help uh, contribute to this book. This is a much larger uh, team of contributors than we had for the first edition. And the second edition was a simple rewrite. There wasn't, I, I did it, didn't ask anybody. So, um, but we really did have a, a broad swath of very, very talented people, uh, very experienced people who were able to contribute to us, um, to, to this project. Uh, I want to call out a couple in specifically Bruce Backus and Linda Vicino uh, at WashU in St. Louis. Uh, we asked them to be involved because they actually have implemented subpart K at a large research institution, and we thought that would be an interesting perspective for them to bring. So they, it, we're not talking about it in an academic sort of a remote sense. We actually got a sense of, of what it takes to install that program. Uh, and Terry Waleko, bless her heart, is an environmental specialist up at UMass Amherst, which is where this PCB and building materials issue has really hit. That was ground zero for that problem. And uh, Terry's job has been for the last five or six years, nothing but PCBs and building materials. And uh, so she was able to take the, the incredible knowledge that she's developed on the job and distill it down into a short section with some good tables and pass that along to us so that we can pass it along to you. Uh, can't go very far without re re uh, represent or uh, without uh, mentioning and and honoring the, the people who helped us make this come true. The production team at APA, Steve and Anita, as I said, did a great job in turning this book around once we finally delivered the content. Uh, Lender Medlin also has been a tremendous supporter of this project, and so I just want to thank her for that. Uh, Patty Ollinger and uh, Amy Orders, who were presidents of Shima while this project was underway. Jack Voorhees, who's the executive director for Shima. Um, Phil Hagan, I mentioned earlier, did our, uh, our legal review, also contributed. And then we've got some other folks who helped out with the project uh, in less direct ways, but they were certainly key contributors. Uh, Bill Brewer, formerly of Duke, uh, was uh, very keen on this project and, and helped it out until he couldn't help us anymore. He, uh, he got ill. Um, uh, Brad King from WashU helped us immensely with the lead-based paint. Uh, Nathan Wade, Cushman Wakefield uh, is, a, um, a, is an outsource for a small school that we met, um, and they 
Nathan participated in our large writing sessions, and then uh, Bella Justice really helped set the tone for our online writing sessions. So this is where you can get it. Um, I, I have to admit that I didn't uh, cross-check with our APA friends on whether the May 18 10% discount is still effective in June. It is so, until the end of the month. It is until the end of June. Outstanding. So uh, you can buy the book uh, through APA or through Shima, and uh, you get that May 18 for a 10% discount through APA. Um, current context. So that was the guide. Now we have the guide. So what's going on? Um, we have a Republican president, but uh, EPA has released generator improvements. Uh, well, sorry, Scott, I'm in your I'm in your slide. And that's okay. You're going in the right direction. So we do have a Republican president. There's been some shifts in funding, but that does not take the teeth out of EPA. They are very much alive and well and continuing to do their inspections and oversight. So no reason to think anything would change, so we can't really relax. Uh, there have been uh, uh, some improvements here. The EPA, the actually generator, this is hard to say about federal regulations, but the Generator Improvement Act, our, our section, really is an improvement. It does make the regulations easier to read. Uh, and easier to handle. And we're currently now, all of us are trying to figure out how to implement that, which um, is actually a good thing. Uh, the PCBs and building materials, we keep talking about that, that does continue to involve, evolve, I'm sorry. Um, and there is a current focus on, on paperwork. So it seems like people aren't dumping as much stuff in the creek. So EPA is focusing very closely on how you do manifest and other paperwork. So again, remain vigilant and you have to have it right. Uh, we hope this book is going to help you with that. Uh, other things they're going to do for those of us that have um, medical centers, drugs are eventually going to become a universal waste, which is really good. Sorry for the phone ringing. Um, there's a, a push to do electronic manifest, and we're all sort of um, out on, on how that's going to impact us. And there are a few subtle changes in, in RICRA, so I think my point is it's still still evolving. Uh, we don't know if it's going to roll back in some, we may have to roll back some of the summaries. Maybe things will continue to get uh, a, a little bit simpler. And, you know, as laws evolve, if EPA does want you to have an environmental management system, so if you have an environmental management system or, or attorneys in your facility, you'll keep up with the regulations and know when major changes are coming. So um, they're they're alive and well, no matter what, what the news might say. Anyway. You're up next. Well, and, and I, I think that's the one of the things to pay attention to is that EPA, even though they what they've I think what EPA has learned is that they no longer have to go out to your site and actually visit you to create uh, notices of violation. So you are turning over records to them in terms of your uh, hazardous waste manifests. And now all they have to do is look at your hazardous waste manifests and find out if there's problems. Uh, and the Texas Department of Environmental Quality and, and the local EPA region have both acted on Texas schools in exactly that way. They've gone and looked at the manifests and said, because the waste was characterized this way and the campus is operating that way, those are in conflict and therefore the campus is guilty of an environmental fail. All that means is that there was an administrative problem. The environment is still just fine, but EPA has learned to use big data. And so um, this is all the more reason to be diligent about this, even though we're 30, 40 years down the road with respect to the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, it doesn't mean by any means that the, the situation is solved. It's something that you have to get on top of and you've got to stay on top of it. So what's next for the guide? Uh, it's currently a text for a workshop. So uh, Scott and his team over in the Environmental Compliance or the Environmental and Sustainability Community of Practice at Shima run an eight hour, is it Scott? Eight hour professional yes, eight development hours. seminar? Eight hour professional development seminar as part of our uh, national conference. And uh, we've been talking to APA about bringing that content in either a four or eight hour session to regional or national conferences with APA. So if you're interested in that, just Tell APA about that, either Billy or uh, someone like Steve Glazner, and uh, we'll try to get it worked out for you. We're talking through uh, making the content available electronically. There are, of course, copyright issues associated with that, and there are also uh, revenue issues associated with that. So how do we make the content electronically available and still uh, get people to buy books? Interesting question. Uh, we're wondering if we make it electronically available, might we distill the book down or split the book up so that you can buy a particular section at a time or you could buy a chapter at a time or something like that. Uh, we're thinking through what we call the active matrix and the active matrix would be if you went to the 
wherever the active matrix is held, and you hovered over or clicked on the intersection between uh, sewer use and laboratories, uh, it would give you specific content about how to manage uh, sewer, Im what sewer impacts are from laboratory functions and how to manage those impacts. Uh, of course, the, that sounds great, and the problem is that there's something like 1,400 different uh, pieces of text that we would have to write. So it's a pretty daunting task, but, um, but we're thinking about that um, in, in close detail. Uh, we're also thinking that we might need to provide more frequent updates to the content. One of the reasons that the production of this guide took so long was that a lot had changed, and we had to go back and, and make sure that we had touched every base. Of course, that job is going to be easier if we do it a little bit at a time all the time as opposed to all at once every seven years. So this is something that we're thinking through. Of course, all of us are volunteers, and except for the APA staff, and, but the subject matter experts are all volunteers, and so how do we keep us uh, doing this? Uh, if we do updated content and we do electronic delivery, I can imagine that we would do a subscription service, and that's something that we're talking through. Uh, we're thinking through a fourth edition in another seven years um, uh, in 2024. Um, perhaps we do another round of, of paper. Uh, we're also talking about companion books. So one of the things that has come up, and uh, as we were in Alexandria talking with APA staff, and especially with facilities uh, folks from the writing team in the room, we talked through a companion book that would be the safety management guide for, for uh, academic facilities. And that would, would not be an OSHA compliance guide, but it would be more about uh, how to create a safe, a, a culture of safety and a safe working environment for facility staff. Um, this is something that Shima is going to be talking about. We have a facilities management community of practice, and so we already have a plan to meet at our national conference next month uh, and talk this through uh, in terms of what that guide might look like and, and how we might engage with APA to get it done. But now that we're starting to think about it, we think there might be a series of these books, uh, one on fire prevention, for instance, one on laboratories. We might engage with IACLEA, the uh, Law Enforcement Association, and talk through design for resilience um, and designing for security, uh, especially in these, in these days of school shootings. So there are lots of ways that we could collaborate between institutions and create guides like this, and essentially uh, every few every year, every 18 months, publish a new one. Um, that's, that takes a great deal of effort by a bunch of volunteers. And so trying to get that to work is going to be difficult. But uh, I think the need is here, especially as we've heard uh, feedback on the environmental management guide. Um, it seems to be well received. People seem to think that it's a very good guide. And so why wouldn't we do more of that? So for sure, we are thinking about that. So um, now. We're ready for questions, and Billy, I don't know how we're going to do this. Uh, do we have any questions queued up already? I sent a note out to all the attendees and asked them if they have questions for our presenters to please type them into our chat box, and we'll take them as we come in. I do have a couple of questions that people have, have sent in. Now that I have the guide, how am I supposed to get all of this done? Who can help me? You want that one, was, John? Uh, no, I was going to let you play it, sir. You know, it's it, so where I'm at, it's fortunate because we do have a large institution, a large environmental health and safety office. But one of the things that I would suggest that people do is rely on their peers and offices such as mine or peer institutions near you. Uh, consultants are outstanding. It's just it becomes an issue of economics. Maybe it's a good idea to get things started, but... You know, a lot of it is just leaning and, and discussing this with your peers and finding out have, what what they've done. Don't don't reinvent the wheel, as they say. Yeah, I think that's a that's absolutely true. And the um, I think probably one of the most important things that I've learned is that you go where the water flows. So if there are if there is a group that is active on your campus that's interested in something like this, if you can find a way to connect to it. At Colorado College, uh, we set up an environmental health and safety program because it was the right thing to do, not because there was any particular pressure to do so. Uh, but we quickly learned that connecting that mission with the environmental sustainability mission was crucial uh, because, this, again, that's something the students are interested in. 
And if we take a more holistic view of what environmental stewardship is, we'll recognize that, that comprehensive environmental management is simply a building block. It's a foundational building block of uh, an environmental stewardship program. So I would say go where the water flows. Um, you will probably also have faculty experts who can help with this, and those are great folks to tap into. Um, they may not be interested in actually helping you characterize hazardous waste, um, but they may certainly be experts in helping you understand what the issues are. So those are some ideas. Uh, I would also say that you can connect other associations. So uh, APA may very well have environmental management content at its conference, but I almost guarantee that SHEMA does. And so one of your options is to come to the SHEMA conference and find out what we're doing. Our next question, is there some consideration of extracting the K through 12 portion of the operations section as a standalone, and would that not be useful? So I, in, on the K through 12 side, I think it would be useful to, uh, to do that, except that um, basically the issues are all the same uh, except for asbestos. Um, in the, um, if we did a security, if IACLEA and APA got together and did a designing for security, designing for resilience uh, guide, then I think there would be some very different issues there. And it might be very important to differentiate because the, the, the context of those, when you're dealing with adults versus minors, the context of those environments is very different. Uh, but the reality is that in the environmental health and safety field and the environmental and well, in fact, in the environmental health and safety field, there is very little difference between the risks and impacts to the facilities workers in terms of health and safety, whether they're at K through 12 or, or in a college and university. And there's very little difference in how uh, to manage the compliance issues in K through 12 versus college and university, with the main difference being AHERA and asbestos, where AHERA, the Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act, was written specifically to create a higher standard for asbestos in K through 12. And our guide covers that standard and covers that difference. Okay, our next question is, please comment on risk mapping findings as a means to prioritize mitigation. Well, uh, what I understand risk mapping to be is that you look at your priorities, you look at your probabilities and your consequences, and then if something is high probability and high consequence, you do that before you do the other things. Uh, and then if it's high probability, low consequence, or l low probability, high consequence, you figure out which between those you wanna get done first, and then you leave all the low consequence, low probability stuff for last. And as, as the fire marshal at the university, one of the things that I pay attention to is fire code deficiencies, whether the, we built it that way or whether um, the occupants changed it or whether or not the code changed, whatever. If we're not meeting current code, we have a problem and we have to address it. Uh, and as we have talked this through, there's something, there's a system called the risk assessment code, which is basically that, is it high or low probability, high or low consequence, add those factors together. Um, and prioritize that way. The problem with risk assessment code models for environmental compliance is that generally speaking, there's either a low probability that you're gonna do something major, uh, like have an actual spill or release, but there's a very high probability you're gonna do something minor, like be in violation, an administrative violation of the regulations. And so the EPA may show up and they may not show up very often, but they may show up. And if they show up and find out that you're not in compliance with underground storage tank regulations on gauging your tanks, for instance, you've always been out of compliance for that if you don't have a program, uh, but it's never re resulted in anything. There's never been a release. The only problem is that you have an administrative violation. So I, I would tend to step away on these factors. I would, I, on, for environmental health and safety is issues, because higher education is generally a safe place to, to work and live and study and learn, um, you don't have these things occurring with very great frequency. We don't have major events occurring with great frequency. So rather than focus on probability and consequence or risk assessment, I would focus on the, con the, the public relations consequences of being on the wrong side of the EPA. So, uh, you, if you have an institution that prides itself on its environmental management, on its sustainability, or on its academic programming with respect to environment, 
and you're found to be not in compliance with some basic uh, regulations on oil spill protection and control, um, and that gets into the newspaper, you're going to be unwinding that damage for years. So even an administrative violation makes the news. And so when that happens, uh, they're going to be asking you why that happened. And uh, generally speaking, for me, the better answer is to be out in front of that problem and try not to have it, regardless of the risk and the probability. Okay, our next question. Is there a section addressing vapor intrusion into buildings? Not specifically. That's in the due diligence sections, or that's when you do your due diligence. So we did not go into that kind of detail in the book, but that is a very important issue. And any time that we're uh, doing a property transfer, that's one of the questions that is asked of us. So, John, do you have any more on that? I do. Um, that's a that's a great question. And actually, I think what we should be doing is looking for those kinds of things that routinely happen, but don't actually have a regulatory driver. So there are always environmental things that happen. In Texas, for instance, we have mold rules on mold because it happens so often. It's like asbestos. Like it just, it becomes a problem so often that we made rules on it. Um, but absent a federal regulatory driver, we wouldn't be inclined to put it in this particular guide, but that's simply because of the heritage of the guide. Now that it's a management guide, this is certainly something we can talk about for the fourth edition, other stuff that isn't driven by regulations. So there, there might be a way to do it in the what should I do portion of this, but there may be another way for us to say, let's look at all the media, let's look at air, water, uh, and uh, land, and see how we have non-regulatory programs that might need to be involved. That's a, to me, that's a, that's a great idea. That's a fa whoever delivered that. What a great idea. Vapor intrusions driven by risk. That particular problem. Yes. Exactly. Okay. We have time for a few more questions. Um, do you have a section specifically for property transfer? That's in the narrative, and it's the due diligence section. And that, when we wrote that, we were talking about real property, but we were also talking about equipment and inventories. And one of the things that uh, can really surprise you in higher education is that your the the local research organization at at my last institution, it was Hewlett Packard, might close down their laboratory, and they may call your chemistry stockroom and say, "We're closing our stockroom. Do you want some of our stuff?" And then your faculty goes shopping. And uh, they come back with things that you can't afford to get rid of when they don't use them. Uh, and so free is better than for cost. And the idea is very present in the chem among the chemistry faculty that we might use this stuff one day. Um, but the reality is that they, if, unless they have a plan to use it, um, there's really no point in acquiring it. So. Uh, you can acquire equipment, for instance, that has radioactive sources, and if you're not clear on the rules regarding radioactive sources, uh, then you're going to end up finding yourself in violation on the radiation side. So our uh, due diligence section covers real property, but it also covers uh, personal property, including chemical inventories. So yes, there is that section. There's a big difference in a free puppy and a free beer, yes. And further with the due diligence, you have to be very careful because, uh, like John said, you, if you purchase a piece of property that has an unknown uh, issue under the ground, uh, there's there's enormous cost associated with that. Uh, and then you have to think about things like Brownsville because in our state we're really pushed to uh, just because a piece of property is contaminated, it doesn't mean we can't develop it. There's just um, uh, regulations and and guidance associated with it. So due diligence is an incredibly important thing in real estate transfer. And especially on the environmental side, but I bet that the uh, the mechanical maintenance folks, the PM people in the, in the audience will get this also. If you buy an old building, you're buying the maintenance of that old building. And so you want to go into that property transfer with your eyes open. Um, so the same is true with radioactive sources. The same is true with uh, lead-based paint, PCBs, asbestos, uh, underground storage tanks, uh, off-site, on-site plumes. Um, you just because that that old house is in the middle of your campus and you haven't owned it ever, but now it's for sale, doesn't mean you want it. Uh, if it has a if it has an unknown underground storage tank that's full of something horrible, uh, you might want to let somebody else deal with that. On the other hand, you might want to take it because it might cost you a million dollars to fix, but then it's yours. So those are the kinds of things that 
the, the diligence program really doesn't, it doesn't often deflect the purchase of the property, uh, but it really does make it an eyes open purchase of the property rather than we have a we have a plan and that plan involves a football stadium and that football stadium needs to go on this piece of property so we have to buy that house uh let's back up and watch so we want that to be an eyes open process okay and just in case uh so the attendees know is if we don't get to answer a question within our one hour time period the questions will be sent to the presenters and they will reach out with an answer to you so our next question is, do you have section on Legionella control programs in water management systems? That's another great question. No, there's no, to our knowledge, there's no federal regulation that requires that. Again, the, the basis of the book, the history of the book is based on compliance assistance. And so this is another one like vapor intrusion uh, where we really should be talking about air quality. Uh, because the air quality is going to be considered to be an environmental problem that facilities has to solve at many schools. And so uh, these are all great tips and uh, something to look for in the fourth edition. Yes, Legionella is a very significant issue, absolutely. In a risk management, anything we do, yes. Uh, someone just commented, ASHRAE and AIHA have two gui guidelines that are extremely helpful in managing Legionella. Yes, that's the better source okay. for that. Yep. Okay. And our final question will be, can you comment on a good system of management and oversight between EHS and science slash art lab safety and who those people would report to? The so, last question was the hardest. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, the, 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 I'm, I'm, the last part stopped me. Um, so the, to me, the environmental health and safety department, especially as it, as it intersects with the academic side of the house, uh, does not exist for any other purpose but to implement the safety objectives of leadership in the academic program. So... It, the, the safety office, whether it reports to facilities or public safety or, or the vice president for research or the, the um, external relations people, it doesn't matter. The safety office is going to go in to a laboratory or a studio and it's going to implement the objectives, the assessment and control objectives that leadership expects. So the safety program doesn't exist for its own purposes. It exists to help the individual uh, PI or faculty member who's responsible for a space in dealing with the obligations that they have because they are uh, an employee and part of the academic leadership of the, of the institution. So a safety office needs to recognize that among those three parties, the individual uh, faculty member or PI uh, or lab occupant, it could actually be a, a, an incubator program, the academic leadership and the safety office, the safety office is actually third in importance. The most important relationship is between the administration and the, the individual faculty, and the safety office needs to simply reflect and respect that relationship. And uh, it's often the case that uh, both of those others, the leadership and the faculty, will try to use the safety office to advantage uh, but the reality is that the faculty have a responsibility to leadership, and the safety office's job is to reinforce that responsibility. At least that's my view. Scott may have a different one. Yeah. Okay. Well, gentlemen, John, Scott, thank you so much for your time in this presentation today. I'd like to thank everyone who took time out of their busy schedule to attend the webinar the presentation, uh, the recording of this will be posted on the Apple webinar page uh, within a few days along with the presentation slides. Again, thank you so much for your participation and we look forward uh, to you attending our next webinar. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.